Hi everyone, I'm really excited to present to you our review paper on neural temporal point processes. I'm Alexander Schur, and this is a joint work with Jan Turkman and Tim Janoszowski from Amazon Research, and my advisor Stefan Gunemann from the Technical University of Munich. We can think of a temporal point process as a probability distribution where each realization is an event sequence with a random number of events. We represent each event in the sequence by its arrival time, ti, and usually we also consider some marks, uh, mi. Uh, in this survey, we mostly focus on the case where the marks um, correspond to categorical class labels. So we can think of these marks as different event types that we have in the sequence. The first question that we have to answer is how can we describe such a neural, how, how can we describe such a TUP model? One uh, common choice is to use the conditional intensity function. The conditional intensity function takes two arguments. The first argument is the is t is the time, and the second argument is h t, which is the history or the set of all the previous events and their marks. The conditional intensity function times t corresponds to the probability of observing the event of type k in an infinitesimal interval surrounding this time t, conditioned on the history of all the past events. Traditional TPP models, such as Poisson processes or Hox processes, usually assume some simple parametric form of the intensity function. However, because of this simplicity, they have one serious limitation. They can only capture very simple uh, patterns in the event sequences. For example, they can model a change in the global uh, trend, so like change in frequency of event occurrences, or they can model clustered or bursty event occurrences. Neural, TPP, neural temporal point processes, on the other hand, model the conditional intensity function using neural networks. This allows them to model really complex interactions between different mark types and different type of interactions between the events. As another advantage, maybe somewhat surprisingly, neural temporal point processes are often even more efficient than their traditional counterparts. So now let's have a look at how these neural temporal point processes are defined in practice. One of the two main classes of TPPs are what we call ultra-aggressive neural TPPs. These models um, uh, define the conditional density somewhat implicitly by actually considering the conditional distribution of the next, of the next uh, event in the sequence given the history of the past events. This process consists of three main parts. First, we have to represent each event in the, in the event history by a feature vector yj. Then given the sequence of the feature vectors corresponding to the past events, we have to encode them into a single representation that we call hi uh, which is the history, uh, which is also called as the history encoding. And finally, given this history encoding, we have to parameterize the conditional distribution over the next event in the sequence. Uh, the first two parts of this process are mostly based on established techniques in the deep learning literature. For example, to represent the event as a feature vector, we can use, we can simply, of course, we can simply use the inter-event times, or we can use positional encodings based on trigonometric functions, similar to how it's done in NLP uh, machine learning models. Then called categorical marks, we again simply use just, a, we again simply use a categorical, uh, we again simply use an embedding layer. The history encoder that takes a sequence um, of the feature vectors and converts it into the, um, into the history encoding and usually is based on one of the two approaches. The first class are recurrent neural network based approaches. The main advantage of these approaches is that they can process the entire sequence with n events in the time that is linear in the number of the events. Self-attention models or transformer models, um, I, on the other hand, scale, as, scale quadratically with the sequence length. However, they provide the advantage of being able to better capture long range interactions between the events. Next, after we have obtained the history embedding from our from the past events, we can model the conditional distribution of the next event. First, let's have a look at the case where there are no marks and we only have to model the next arrival time. The way it's usually done is by instead considering the intra-event time, so the time until the next event. This intra-event time, tau i, is just a non-negative random variable. So all we have to do to model it is to first pick some parametric PDF of some non-negative random variable, for example, the exponential distribution or the gamma distribution, maybe log normal distribution. Um, um, of course, it has to be parametric. Next, we take the history embedding hi and convert it um, and use it to compute the parameters theta i. Here in this picture, you see how it's done using, using a simple affine layer and some nonlinearity that is used to ensure the constraints such as positivity of the parameters. Finally, we plug in these parameters theta i into this, into this parametric PDF function, and this gives us the, the conditional PDF that we are looking for. 
uh, which completely defines the distribution of the next interim event time. Um, actually, there are quite a few technical details in how this can be done in practice, and there are also some trade-offs involved, involved in this process. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have time to go over all of them in here, so please have a look at the paper to learn more if you're interested. Next, um, let's see how it's actually done when we are dealing with marks in the sequence. Of course, one very simple idea is to assume that the inter event times and the marks are conditionally independent. And then if we will say, hey, if we have condition, if we have categorical marks, then we simply have to parameterize another categorical distribution for the marks given the history embedding HI. A more flexible um, an approach is to uh, instead either condition the marks on the time, which means that we have to define a separate mark distribution for each time in the future, or alternative to define the marks, uh, the time condition on the marks which means that we model a separate inter-event time distribution for each of the capital K different marks. The second big class of neural TPP models are based on what we call continuous time state evolution. In such models, we usually have some vector, some um, state, which is represented by a vector that evolves continuously in the, um, in the time. Um, the, you, can see it in the, you can see an example of this evolution in the, in the lower part of the figure. Um, the state usually evolves continuously in between the events, typically following something, uh, some process described by an ordinary differential equation. But then whenever an event happens, we can often have a, and we will have a discrete update of the state, which corresponds to a jump on the ODE. Um, then um, the state that evolves in this pattern described in here is used to directly define the conditional intensity function of our temporal point process. For example, we can feed the state through a multi-layer perceptron um, and then uh, pass it to some non-negative function and get the conditional intensity at each time uh, in space. And specifying the conditional intensity completely defines our temporal point process. Let's have a look at the two at the main differences between autoregressive and continuous time TPP models. Autoregressive models are usually very efficient. Assuming that we properly choose the, our parameterization for the intervent time distribution, it is possible to compute the likelihood and, and also perform sampling analytically in close form, so very quickly and efficiently. On the other hand, continuous time uh, models um, cannot do this. Um, in these models, in order to compute the likelihood or to do sampling, we first have to compute the state at each point in time, and additionally, we have to integrate the intensity to, to compute the likelihood. We will see why in the next slide. Um, but to keep it short, this process requires, requires us to do numerical integration, which is less efficient than in, in the autoregressive models. However, continuous time state evolution models have one significant advantage. Since the state is defined at each point in time, they can very naturally handle missing data, which can be helpful in some applications such as modeling um, electronic health records, which means we can try to predict the state of the patient at every point in time and not only uh, specifically at the events. Temporal point processes are, just like any other generative model, are usually trained with maximum likelihood estimation. This means that we usually have some set of training sequences that we call here D-train, and then the training objective um, is just to maximize the log likelihood of all the sequences in the training set. And we maximize them with respect to the model parameters, so say the encoder parameters, maybe the parameters of uh, the linear layer that we saw before. Um, the likelihood function for TPP is somewhat uh, has uh, somewhat of an, has an intuitive has an intuitive interpretation here. The first term, so this, the first sum that we see here, can be thought of the, as the logarithm of the probability of observing the events of specific types specifically at the locations where we observe them, and the second term, so the sum with the integral, can be thought of as the probability of not observing the events anywhere else uh, in the interval that we have been uh, looking at. Again, as for many generative models, maximum likelihood is not the only training objective, even though it's the most popular one. Another choice is, um, usually can be represented as this objective function that you see here. You see we take an expectation with respect to our TPP, which means we are sampling the variable length event sequences from our temporal point process P theta, and then we compute some utility function f of x that we are trying to maximize in expectation. Um, one example of such losses are adversarial losses or buster and distance based losses that are also often used to train other generative models, for example, GANs. Um, uh, however, uh, such uh, objective functions also sometimes come up based on the applications of TPPs. For example, we can use a temporal point process to specify, to specify a stochastic policy of a reinforcement learning agent, 
in that case, the function f of x would correspond to the reward function. Another example is variational inference. So we can think of a, a temporal point process, p theta, as an approximate posterior distribution um, over some latent variables in a probabilistic model. And then um, the objective function f of x would be the evidence lower bound that we are trying to maximize. OK, now that we have trained our TPP model, what can we do with it? Well, one very intuitive application of this model is prediction. So let's say we train our model on lots of data, and now we get in some new sequence that is partially observed, and now you want to answer some questions about what will happen in the future. For example, with the neural TPP, we can say, uh, we can answer the question of when the next event will happen, or what type the next event will have, or we can even answer some more complicated queries. For example, we can sample many trajectories over the forecast horizon, and then we can answer the question of how many blue events happen on average in this prediction interval that we care about. Another big class of applications for neural TPPs are connected to relational data. Marked temporal point processes provide a very natural representation to um, processes such as um, some information diffusion on social media. So for example, we can think of each mark as some node in a social media graph, or so in a social network, um, and then each event corresponds to some activity by a specific user in the network. And of course, there are different interactions happening between all of them, so users influence each other. And you might be interested in uncovering this uh, structure uh, in here. For example, we, like one type of, type of thing that we can do is we can try to cluster together users that have similar activity patterns. This can be useful to, for example, find coordinated activity on the network or to find bots. Another example is connected to Granger causality, which is just some mathematical framework for defining dependency between different event types. For example, we can see in this figure below here that usually we have an orange event that follows a blue event. And um, so we could maybe, so if we do Granger causality analysis on such data, uh, or a neural TPP model trained on such data, we will likely um, be able to determine that uh, blue events are likely to cause orange events in this data. Of course, Despite all these exciting thing, developments that I described so far, there is still a lot of work that has to be done in the field of neural TPPs. One big class of questions that um, is not really adequately answered so far in the literature is how to properly evaluate and compare different TPP models. So for people mostly, of course, there are some questions related to the experimental protocol. So for example, people often use different data sets, different implementations of the baselines, which is why it's some, maybe sometimes hard to compare the results. Another also, the data sets are often not a very high quality, so finding good high quality data sets would definitely make it easier to uh, better compare different models. Also, the metrics for TPPs um, is not really an established thing. So people have tried using different metrics, but it might be that by finding some better metrics or maybe metrics that are more relevant to the tasks that um, are actually of interest, you might be able to better guide the search for better neural TPP models. And finally, the last part, but definitely not the least, is where I think most of the exciting new results um, are going to come in the following years, um, is applications of neural TPPs to other domains. Traditional TPPs have been applied widely in neuroscience and spinology finance. However, the developments with neuro related to neural TPPs are mostly staying inside the machine learning community. We think that applying, that, uh, applying these ideas from neural TPPs in these other domains is bound to have a significant impact on those areas, but will also give us as machine learning researchers some insights on how we should develop the models, what the important aspects are um, in design and like what, uh, what other new tasks we can solve with these models. Um, okay, that's it with the presentation. I hope I was able to share some of my excitement with you and now you're also interested in learning more about neural TPPs. And if you wanna have a chat about them, please come to our poster session, read the paper, and I'll be very happy to talk to you about more about neural TPPs. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to what comes next in this new area of research. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye.